Happy Thursday and welcome to another edition of Husker Online Headlines. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple with you every week as we break down what we think are some of the five biggest headlines uh, that might concern you Husker fans out there. Uh, before we get to headline number one this week, um, no better time to try out Husker Online. Uh, we've got a great deal for our YouTube listeners right now. Get two months of access to Husker Online for just $1. Got to use promo code NU1 at checkout. That's promo code NU1 for two months of access for $1. <clears throat> All right, Steve Sipple, let's let's take it into headline number one here this week. Uh, 2024 recruiting has come to a close. <clears throat> now the page is turned to 2025, and they've laid a really good foundation, but um, – you know, there were a couple things brewing with 2024. Keona Wilhite took an official yeah. visit to Tucson, Arizona, defensive end. Um, Nebraska was uh, set to possibly do an in-home with Wilhite on Friday with Matt Rule. That will not happen uh, for whatever reason. Uh, both parties have kind of moved on. So it, at least today it feels like the roster additions for 2024 on scholarship appear to be done. Well, there you go. I mean, that's it's interesting, isn't it? You can kind of start to turn the page in recruiting, but now you have your roster, and I only see that as good. Will Height, I mean, you always you like guys coming off the edge. They still have Jalen Williams, and I mean, you're you're looking at him and several others. So I well, like it though, Sean. I like the kind of the turning page part of this. I, I think this time of the year in recruiting the pool of available players becomes very small. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't think you want to force it. I think you want to be um, more selective because mm -hmm. sometimes it makes more sense. All right. Could we find a Keona will height guy that's better next year in 2025 right. versus trying to force it. <laughs> and, you know, will height was one of the hot names left out there because of the change, but because of the change, uh, the change at Washington. Oh, okay. Yeah. He was committed to Washington and because then, of the coaching change, and and he became available um, at that point um, with the change there. So I think at this point you, you kind of move forward, and you know, twenty twenty five recruiting has been um, full speed ahead, and you know, just even locally, it's really caught my attention the number of teams that have come into the state of Nebraska on the outside. Um, just you know, teams like Millard South. Uh, who have a four-star tight end, Chase Lofton, who we have ranked number one and on three. Uh, but you can argue Christian Jones from Westside is also the number one. There's kind of two number one Number one in the state? For 2025. Okay. Uh, both four-star guys. Um, we know Millard South tweeted this out. They had 17 Power 5 programs come through their hallways um, over the month of January. Tight ends. Tight ends in this state. That's become... I mean, a popular position, obviously, Carter Nelson, Thomas Fedoni's not from the state, but he's bordered it practically from the state. So the line gets pretty long. Eric Ingwerson, Carter oh, Nelson. There you go. I mean, you can go down the line last year and, and, you know, this was in the summertime, but I looked this up. There were more power five tight ends last year in the state of Nebraska than there were in the state of California. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Now, what is that? But this place puts out tight ends. And, you know, another one that's, that's really emerged here for Nebraska is Raymond Zebert okay. uh, or from Springfield. Right. Um, he picked up offers on Wednesday from the Miami Hurricanes and Arkansas, Oklahoma State, and Nebraska came in first. And that's why it's important for Nebraska. If they like a guy. You got to recognize, like, especially at that tight end position, other teams are going to come into Nebraska now and recruit some of these guys. So I think Nebraska getting that first offer to Zebert really was big because you saw how much he's blown up already. Yeah, Nebraska's in there with them um, with those teams, and yeah, the competition's good. It's really interesting that seventeen schools, big time schools, right? Went big time to Miller power, South, I mean, Power Five, yeah, Power Five, power like five USC, schools. you name it, Miami, Penn exciting. State, yeah, and there's got to be if a lot of times. There's going to be, if a, a player's really good, there's going to be competition for him, and there's no guarantees. So that'll be very interesting to watch. Sean, changing the subject a little bit, how many people even remember that signing day, the second signing day is Wednesday? 
yeah, talk about it. Like nobody. And we're going to have a press conference with Matt Rule, but really the yeah. press conference is going to be kind of like the preview before the preview of spring practice. So kind of, kind of a wrapping up things. Matt Rule's yet to address some of the January transfers, so that would right. be big to get his thoughts. You're right. Glenn Thomas has been hired. Could Dana Holgerson be hired? I mean, I think there's a lot of topics like that mm -hmm. that will take the day mm -hmm. where you know, they're going to announce a few walk-ons like Rowdy Bauer from Norfolk and a couple guys like that might be added to the roster that day. Um, but you're, you're right. Signing day in February is not what it was. The second signing. The day. second signing in yeah. February. Yeah, I mean, I said February. Yeah, yeah. December is the early one. Yeah, and just so I think there's a thought to even push the December one earlier. Because once the college football playoff begins to 12 teams, you know, you could have teams playing three or four games. And how do you have time to go out and recruit? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing if you're getting ready for Maryland in a bowl game in Charlotte mm -hmm. to, to, to forego bowl preparations mm -hmm. and not prep, not prep for Maryland if you're Auburn. It's another thing if you got a playoff game or two playoff games in December um, along with the conference championship game. So I do think there's going to be long-term changes with signing days and recruiting. Will it happen in 2025? Probably not. But I, I think they're, they're going to go through a year or two of these things and realize, man, we got to probably adjust this again. Yeah. I, there's and, there, and Sean, I think you'd agree. There's no easy answers here with, as far as the college football schedule goes, the, the way the count, I guess I, you should say calendar. There's just, there's nothing, there's nothing well, easy about it. I think it is pretty simple that, you could have an August signing day because if everybody starts the process in January with coaches meeting with you, then you come and make your visits in March, April, May, June. Okay. Why not the sign in August? Right. I mean, the letters are binding, but they're really not binding the transfer, Absolutely. the transfer portal. Oh yeah. Like there's no more penalty <laughs> before when you sign that letter, you were locked in, you had to sit out a year, you had to get released. It's a pretty binding God, document. Good point. Yeah, and that's a so good point. What I mean, why, why, why do you need to spend all of December seeing everybody right now? <laughs> God, that's a good point. If they come to you, but there's still some things that have to be adjusted. January, though, like I said, it's become more 2025 right. junior recruiting. Mm -hmm. um, coaches can now talk to kids at schools, mm -hmm. and so if you're Christian Jones at Westside, Chase Lofton, who was at Elkhorn North, he's now at Millard South, two four-star kids and you're already identified as a four-star by a lot of people, everybody in the country has the time in January to come to Omaha, lay eyes on you. And head coaches are out, And too. head coaches. I mean, Chris Kleiman's been in schools locally. Uh, Brett Venables has been up to see these guys. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think Venables came up here to see Christian Jones. He wanted to see Christian Jones. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what happens. And, you know, that's happened over the years. I remember Urban Meyer was spotted at an Arby's by Bass Pro Shop um, to go look at um, uh, the, what's the quarterback from Council Bluffs at TCU? Oh, don't do that to me, redhead kid. God, how I, am I blanking on his name? You almost, I voted for him on my Heisman ballot. TCU, Max Duggan. Sorry. No, good job, good pull. How did you not pull out Max Duggan? I, I really relied on you there for. A, I know. A lift. I should have. I, I mean, I can describe. I can tell you everything about him. I crashed the helicopter and I pulled it right up. Yeah, there, you got but, it. You got it. Uh, Max, Max Duggan. Duggan. You know, like so. That's happened for years where if there's a prime prospect, a head coach is going to go out and try to see that kid in person. It's ramped up even more, though, because you're not even worried about seniors right now. You're mm -hmm. only worried about juniors and, and sophomores. Mm -hmm. So, all right, before we take it to headline number two, Husker Online headline, Steve Sipple, is brought to you by who? Uh, Sean, it's brought to you by Larson Motors. Uh, and this is, I said the other day, it's, I don't know, Sean, have you found that your schedule has slowed down a little bit? holidays are over right a little bit it, it never slows down completely but this is a time of year where it might make sense to find some time to go to nebraska city if you're looking for a new vehicle larson motors is one of the midwest's only dealerships with all the major brands in one location so finding your chevrolet gmc hummer ford chrysler dodge jeep or ram really has never been easier Start your new experience today at LarsonMotorGroup.com or at Larson Motors in Nebraska City. You know what they say, Sean? Larson Motors, real people, real deals. All right. Well, let's take it to headline number two. Yes. Um, Nebraska, for, for months, 
Alex Mansky has kind of been their primary 2025 quarterback target really since he got his offer at camp in June last year. Um, but a new quarterback name has really emerged here this week. Dylan Duff out of St. Louis, who actually attended Nebraska's spring game last year, uh, was offered by Nebraska, visited by Matt Rule, visited uh, by new co-quarterbacks, Coach Glenn Thomas, Marcus Satterfield. Duff is 6'3", 185. He's got a Duke offer, a Missouri offer, Central Florida, K-State, Northwestern, Minnesota. Um, so he's just starting to get going. This week alone, three power fives came in, including Nebraska. Um, I think he's a guy to watch. And I think the next thing to watch now is March, because in February, we're dead. Kids can't come to you. You can't come to them. It's shut down. Now, in March, they can come to you. So who will be the first quarterback Nebraska gets on campus in ideally March? Uh, can they get Mansky up here? Mansky yeah. hasn't been here since October. Mm -hmm. um, before October, he had been here five times. Mm -hmm. Duff went here last spring, got his offer this week. Um, you would think that it will be a priority to try to get him on campus in March. Can you can you identify their priority at quarterback? Are you still saying Mansky, or are you starting to switch a little bit i think it it is and still it is it's mansky until it's not mansky i i think mansky has to move on and you know whether that's a m whether that's um iowa state i think those are the two and look the reality is the dylan riola commit along paired with daniel right, kalen has right. changed the situation it has. if if riola is not here i think it would probably look a lot more promising but you got with mansky with right? mansky yeah um but he's also very busy i mean you forget He's a three-sport athlete, plays mm -hmm. baseball, plays mm -hmm. football, mm -hmm. plays basketball. He might even do track. You know, in Iowa, you, you can play four sports. Okay. So I don't know if he does track in the spring or not. I don't know, but he's a good, he's a good-looking quarterback. Yeah. I mean, he's big, strong kid in the pocket, and he can run. He fits exactly what – He's like a Josh Allen-style quarterback. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a pitcher for the baseball team. He's a really good basketball player. I mean, he's a throwback, Midwestern, multi-sport athlete guy. And Colin Klein now at AM, um, they, they offer okay. him. So that's that's one to watch with him. But Iowa State is kind of the perceived leader. Okay. Um, no surprise, Alex Mansky is a big Brock Purdy fan. Okay. That helps. I would say obviously now AM, the picture with Mansky and AM is interesting to me because they typically are after a higher profile. Correct. Right. That's kind of my thought, too. I mean, if you're coming into A&M with one of the most robust collectives in America with a three star quarterback, like taking Mansky is almost a version of like Ohio State taking Lincoln Keenholz. Right. You wonder how the fan base reacts to that. Like Lincoln Keenholz was from Pierre, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Ohio State's five star city. You know, mm -hmm. they take every five star quarterback every year. Um, and Keenholz is a talented quarterback. I mean, that, that, that's what Mansky kind of reminds me of. It's like a version of Keenholz. So yeah, Midwestern, smaller school guy. I mean, school in the town he's in is it's not like real small, but Nebraska Algona. can't Nebraska can't fly a plane in there. Algona, Iowa. It's you know, and it's closer to Ames. You know, in terms of distance, it's the quarterback recruitment will be interesting going forward for several reasons but and dylan is the main one to me and and danny too i don't think we've talked sometimes about danny kalen enough but yeah you just wonder what caliber a guy they can bring in here well with, harburg's got two more years left yeah he's i don't think he's 21 yet and we get a lot of questions what about the walk-on guys and you know yeah, well, both yeah. those guys wokey yeah and and longville uh, luke longville mm -hmm. were scout team players last year so you know they didn't get a lot of rep this spring well, at least get to see them run the Nebraska offense. Mm -hmm. um, it's important, too. It is. I and mean, then Bodie Sokop from Blair will come in as a walk-on. Mm -hmm. And I've made my case on that. It usually falls on deaf ears that you got to try to get a good walk-on. I mean, somehow, I, I don't know how you do it. Is it going to be a trick in some cases? But a guy that can go if like you need him. If Riker, you need him. Like a Riker. Like Riker Fife was the example of a great one. Great walk on Ron Kellogg, solid walk on. Yeah. I mean, they they had a start games and they yeah. won games as starters. Absolutely, yeah. Riker, remember the Maryland game? I remember twenty eight to seven. Yeah, and he played well. Senior day. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, I'm going to lock in harder on the quarterback recruiting as we go forward because it's really interesting to me. All right, uh, let's take it over now to headline number three. 
Okay. And Steve Sipple, you've done a lot of reading and research on this. Yeah. Um, Tennessee has taken on the NCAA. NCAA is reportedly coming at Tennessee with an investigation about misusage of their NIL. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of Nebraska connections there. Dante Plow Plowman um, is the chancellor. Is the chancellor, and she was formerly in a high leadership role at Nebraska mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you follow Nebraska and the university closely, you probably saw um, Plowman's name in the headlines because she's out in front of this thing as well. She is. Um, but it's a big story. I think a lot of people are going to watch this closely. Um, and what does the NCAA have on Tennessee? What are they coming at them for? And could this hurt the NCAA actually more if they lose this one as well? Okay, so the one distinction you have to make, this isn't Tennessee going after the NCAA. It's it's the state attorney general. Um, and He's not representing Tennessee. He's representing student athletes. And the, the state of Virginia as well. Right. Filed yeah. One. yeah, so it's a distinct, a important distinction to make. It is not the University of Tennessee taking on the NCAA. It is the attorney general in the state of Tennessee. Now, he's doing it. I mean, he's he's doing it on behalf of student athletes throughout the state of Tennessee, including ones who are at Tennessee. But it's it what it does, Sean. I mean, explaining it in in layman's terms, this lawsuit against the NCAA seeks to deregulate the process by which recruits can negotiate recruits can negotiate NIL contracts and communicate with schools directly about NIL opportunities before enrolling or signing a letter of intent. If one allegation the NCAA is exploring, exploring against Tennessee is whether Nico, I'm a leave he's a quarterback, five-star quarterback. His NIL deal was part of a recruiting inducement, which would violate NCAA rules. I think the reason that Adonde Plowman is upset is because she knows that that's happening all over the country and that the NCAA is effectively just using Tennessee as an example. Yeah, the biggest joke is, oh, NIL can't be used to entice athletes to come to your school. <laughs> what is it being used for? <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. It's a joke. And you can see why Tennessee officials, why Dondi Plowman, the chancellor, why the state attorney general, why the governor, Bill Lee, they're up in arms. And you know what? If you read about it, they should be because it's ridiculous. Like, yeah, there, it's happening all over the country. And the NCAA has locked in pretty hard on Tennessee, it looks like. Yeah. And so the state attorney general. Now, there's political reasons for that, right? What better? I mean rally behind your football team pretty good pretty good idea for the state attorney yeah. general who, who's an elected official generally uh football rallies people from both sides good point i mean there's very few things we agree on in this country but football is one of them right and no matter where you vote you, you tend to root for your football team where you live and you know if they're trying to hurt tennessee and what they're doing yeah and i, I think we've reached a point now Football is making so much money. It's bringing in so much money into the grand scheme of things with yes. the television deals, the ticket sales, the donations, and the NIL. This is another example of why football just needs to get the heck out of the NCAA and operate as its own league within the schools. Let the other sports operate on the NCAA, but football, they've grown bigger than the NCAA. It's the the question then becomes who's the gov what what's the governing body what's the rule book look like who drafts the rule book what what are the rules yeah and the problem point? is like it's with, easier said than done Sean That's yeah it, it almost becomes political in a sense because both the SEC and the Big Ten would think they're in charge right and and it would be really hard to just name somebody the commissioner right and. and SEC and Big Ten are not going to relinquish any of their money they're getting now to help the Big 12 and to help the ACC. Uh -huh. Like, So they have it made. It's the power two right now in college. It's no longer the power five. It's power four technically, but really it's the power two. Right. So back to the matter at hand. It, what, what we're trying to what I'm trying to drive home to people here is if the NCAA can punish Tennessee for its inducements nil wise to i'm Aliba, the quarterback then it could go after pretty much every school in a power conference right 
I mean, that's the problem. That's the fundamental issue right now. Um, and now when you read all this stuff, now this is where you don't have to agree with me and I don't fully, I, I got, I can't go, I can't lean too hard into this, but I get a little tired of everybody pointing to the NCAA and saying they're the problem with NIL. They, I mean, what you're talking about is there's a tangle of state laws and NCAA in NCAA rules regarding NIL that have created this untenable situation. But most people just look at the NCAA and say, that's the problem. They didn't manage this. No, I don't. Uh, uh-uh. there's blame to be shared here. There's a lot of blame. I get tired. I'm, I, it's weird to defend the NCAA, but I'm doing it. I get tired of everybody pointing at the NCAA state lawmakers pushed this through, pushed NIL through. And, and really what, what makes me sick is when state lawmakers point at the NCAA. Come on. You're the ones who pushed a lot of this through. You have stupid laws on the books. Um, don't don't just make the NCAA the all the problem here. It's not all the well, problem. I think it started of- in California. Of course it did. It it So, no, it's not just the NCAA. Well, and there was a massive misread on what they thought NIL was going to be. At the beginning, everyone thought NIL was going to be, oh, You'll make a tweet for Runza and get a $50 gift card as an athlete. Cool. Or you'll do a podcast with Sean Callahan in their studio and you make a little bit of money on the side. What's it become? That was NIL for about a month. <laughs> right. And, and then what it became. And then it became collectives. Collectives. And I can still remember when we started doing some of the shows, um, somebody who I'd consider as knowledgeable about NIL as anybody I've ever met said to me, he's like, why are you doing all this stuff? He goes, NIL is going to be so much bigger than this. Like, like these little nickel and dime things are nothing. Right. Doing doing a show on a radio station or a burrito ad or or a runs a gift card that's nothing. Right like, now, now high profile quarterbacks are worth one point five to two. They're million. making more money than coordinators. Right, and in some cases, they're making more money than group of five head coaches. Right, there are there there will be power five high profile quarterbacks who come to campus and look for condos to buy, look for houses to buy. It's a, the world's changed dramatically, but it's not just an NCAA issue. And the other thing that really pisses me off is when, when media media who pushed, who just were all in, all in pay the players, pay, pay the players. And now they're criticizing what's going well, well, come on, you pushed it. You pushed it. It wasn't ready. Nobody was ready for it. That they, there, no, there weren't rules in place because it happened all happened too fast. So now you you get what you paid for here. Yeah, once don't the complain Supreme about court it. rules their fist on something. It's a you know, and it was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court. Right. I, yeah. I, I mean, there were people like me who were saying this is moving too fast. I mean, it's how, how are you gonna how are you gonna make it work? Well, well it's not working. I, I mean, can still remember on July first of twenty twenty one, uh, when it started, right at midnight. You know, like a lot of people did when NIL, a lot of people were almost in disbelief. Like, wait a minute, this is real. Yeah. Oh man. It came on too fast. It just had, I mean, it came out of nowhere. I so. hate to take the, I hate to do this where I defend the NCAA because you just get killed for it. I mean, I'll get killed in the mess on, on the comments. I understand, but it's not all of the NCAA's fault. It's the, the yeah, state. It's the their st- fault though, that they had the opportunity to, to rein it in and control it earlier. And, and they, bet on the horse that said this will never happen i think you're right about that against the supreme court the ncaa dragged its feet for sure they didn't think state lawmakers in the supreme court would allow this and that's where they totally misread it then they pushed it then the state then the states the state lawmakers pushed it through the states have laws it's just a really it's a tangled web because nobody knows exactly what the rules are and and they and they evolve the rules are evolving so it's hard to keep up. And when you it. take it out of the NCAA and its legislative body, the schools, it's really hard to overturn state lawmakers in the Supreme Court. It's impossible. Right. And, and so that's a powder cake. <laughs> it's a powder, powder cake. cake. All right. <laughs> Let's take it to headline number four. And this caught my attention. Yes. Um, Aaron Sanderford from the Nebraska Examiner um, this week wrote a really, really good article about Nebraska. Um you know, trying to make the right moves behind the scenes to regain their AAU status. And if you're not familiar what the AAU is, it's not a basketball league. <laughs> it's 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 a prestigious group kids, of yeah. university organizations. 
and Steve Sipple, there are 18 teams in the Big Ten mm-hmm. in 2024. 17 of them are a part of the prestigious AAU. One team is not. Who is that one team? That is Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the AAU, which is the Association of American Universities, and is a and it is prestigious in the university research world. And now, the one thing I don't this is what we got to talk about. I read the article. I re- read Aaron's article, and the first thing that struck me was I didn't realize that Nebraska needed to do this to secure its future with the big 10 is it i would ask you the question is it absolutely necessary for nebraska to be an aau school i just think it helps keep you secure at the same table i can't ever i mean the rate the television ratings nebraska is bringing in this year it still shows their value to this league right now granted caitlin clark brought most of the number but nebraska helped it like for the basketball game like They just had the all-time most watched women's basketball game. They had the most watched women's volleyball games. And obviously, with football, Nebraska is extremely competitive as one of the more highly watched teams out there in college football. So those things are there. But I don't think you want to be the only school not in the AAA. I just – the question I have as you talk is if Nebraska is a ratings draw right now as a struggling program or a program that that has struggled, and and then it starts winning – I don't. I, I, it's, it would be interesting to me that someone would use this AAU matter against them. Now, having said all that, I think it 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 would be good for Nebraska to be a member of the AAU. And what they're doing is kind of just reconfiguring how they how money's allotted. They would combine research dollars. Yeah, UNL flagship campus and the University of Nebraska Medic, Medical Center. Um, they would push. They would combine those. Okay. I hope people understand what we're talking about. So essentially they would take like, let's just, I'm going to throw out an estimate of what Aaron said in his article. It was like roughly 112, $115 million for UNL and the, for, med, the, for the flagship for campus. the flat. And then the, the med school is about the same. Right. So if you go, if you combine the campuses, you can say your research dollars are more like 230 million. 250 is what two, you get to. And yeah. then at, at 250, you're squarely with the teams in the AAU right. because they recognize everybody in the AAU for the most part, I believe has a med school tied in, which greatly boosts your research dollars. Um, the AAU does not recognize agriculture research, which is a hot, hot topic because our hot button topic, because places like Iowa state, Nebraska, K state, it's you know, agriculture is very important to this country. Yeah. Much more important than a, than a place like Purdue. Um, and what they do, I mean, people got to eat and figure out ways to survive. I mean, like, right. And, and to, to, to not put, <laughs> well, I think we'll survive. I know, but it's <laughs> like to not act like, right. You know, that's important. No, I got it. I got, you it. know, but that's why Nebraska was essentially booted from the AAU because their agriculture research was no longer recognized. By and yeah, it wasn't. And they, it's not combined with the medical center research dollars, which is, which is a higher number than the flagships research dollars. So if they combine, if they combine UNL and UN, UNMC research dollars, it would push that total to 251 million for Nebraska, which to put into context, the university of Oregon's 97 million. Now, and they're in the AAU. And they are in the AAU. Iowa, of course, is in the AAU at three hundred and fourteen million. So you, you'd you'd be close to Iowa. Michigan leads the way, sets the standard in the Big Ten at one billion um, annually. Annually. So yeah, it's. I think it's significant. I think it's definitely significant. I don't think you. I, I agree with you. I don't think you want to be the only one in your league that's not in. Well, and in it. I went to Nebraska. You went. To, I have a lot of pride in. Mm-hmm the school here the Mm -hmm. campus and i I don't look at it as i mean i don't look at it as like a beneath education like i Mm -hmm. i I, it's a great school and i think people here in the state would say the same thing like this is not a school where a lot of people from out of state and whatnot i mean it's more of an in-state school to provide Mm -hmm. opportunities for people to build their careers and take jobs in nebraska yeah this is it was a huge discussion for Nebraska it was a huge bullet point as Nebraska was making moves to get in the Big Ten. It was an AAU member at that time. Then right in 2011, all of a sudden, Nebraska was booted out. Yeah, it's almost like booted once out. they joined the Big Ten, the Big Ten schools 
Wisconsin and Michigan particularly, and then Texas was also involved, who was mad that Nebraska blew up the Big 12 with them, Mm -hmm. pulled up the hood of the car (laughs) and said, hey, wait a minute. Maybe that's the case. Wait a minute. You might be joining the Big 10, but we're going to expose you that you're not really on par with your other new members. That may may be the way it was. I think right now, it's at this point, people that are watching are now saying, oh, yeah, the AAU. I remember that. That was a part of the discussion when Nebraska joined the Big Ten. It, it, I think it's just coming to people. When I was reading the article, that's what I was like, okay, yeah, this is all. I can re- kind of remember all this now. But, yeah, it's just a matter. It's a, it, it seems like a small adjustment. It's not. It, there's a lot of political ramifications to combining the flagship university's research dollars with UNMCs. But what leaders would say is it makes sense for all of us to be together. It's kind of stand as one and not be fragmented. Like, like the flagship part of it, it's seen as a Lincoln versus Omaha thing, kind of. So I think that the leadership at UNL would say, no, this would be good for everybody. If we just combine these research dollars, make the total 251 million, then we're in AAU there's probably a more of a sense of alignment if it's just even a sense that's good. So, and but it's Trev Alberts a lot of credit because I think he's pushed hard for this. Yeah, I would think he. Well, would. he's very close um, to Dr. Gold at, mm-hmm. at the Med Center and spent a lot of years in Omaha, UNO. So he understands the framework of things. The Chancellor is Gold, Dr. Gold. Dr. Gold. Right? Yeah. So yeah, this is something to watch. Um, to see if Nebraska would regain that AAU membership. And I just wonder how many years it would take. Like, are we talking like six, eight years from now, or could it happen quickly? I don't know. I couldn't I couldn't ascertain that from the article. Because it's never happened before. I don't, it's my understanding what Nebraska is trying to do, mm-hmm. where you get boot. First of all, get booted. I don't. And Iowa State, instead of getting booted, resigned from the AAU. Okay. Like, Nebraska made it go to the vote. Okay. And, and you know, Made, it's made a hit it. to your prestige as a university, for sure. But I that, don't know if Matt Rule, I wonder if he even, like if Matt's watching Pillow, um, if he even thinks about this stuff. I doubt it. No. Yeah, no. it's a great, great Jan- February 1st time. Oh, yeah. The, the, this, we are, I, it dawned on me yesterday. We're kind of in that time of year where we're talking about NCAA, NIL matters, AAU. A lot of the focus shifts from, probably what we like most, which is football discussion, you know? I mean, we, we're out over our skis a little bit in this one. Right? We're uh, in that time of year where you probably need to start having a couple guests joining us on headlines. That would be a good idea. And we did, I mean, this we've done headlines for a full year now. It's been a wildly successful show for us. Right. And we enjoy it's, doing it. It's time to get some guests. Got to get some guests next month. Yeah. yeah. All right. We, final we headline. Headline number five, winter conditioning. Yes. Matt drill season is here. Now, Nebraska has had uh, three full weeks of players back on campus, lifting, yep. training. The famed Matt Rule mat drills mm-hmm. will begin next week on Tuesday, I'm told. And what is a mat drill? They yeah, are what is it? High intensity, um, you know, boot camp style drills. The coaches can run the drills, push the team to their limits, kind of build your mental toughness, your character. Um, and obviously get conditioning in, but you'll see Matt Rule and his entire coaching staff down there at five, six in the morning running these drills for the next several weeks. Um, and I don't know how long Matt drills run, maybe six weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they've had three weeks of lifting now, and then we're about six weeks from spring break. So I would imagine the Matt drills will take the team all the way to spring break. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a critical time for the coaching staff, it is all over the country. I mean, this isn't, this isn't exclusive. It's not unique to Nebraska, but it is a critical time. Sometimes it'll weed out some players, although second year staff, you probably got most of the guys that they're just here. They understand the culture. It, it, I would say though, it reestablishes the culture a little bit and it's still, again, still pretty young in Matt rules tenure, but that's, what's going on. I think people, I, I think people always do kind of wonder what's going on at the stadium right now. Well, that's what's going on. They're they're in the midst of winter conditioning and it'll ramp up Tuesday. Well, and, and you know, it's not just scholarship guys you might see weed out. You know, if you're a walk on guy that's just barely hanging on, some guys have to ask themselves, do you really want to go through all go this? Go through that again. Do you yeah. want to do right. this again? Yeah, because it's not easy. 
knowing that you have next to no chance to see the field. Yeah, even yeah, some of them may be on specials. But maybe. That's it. The other thing that's critical, Sean, really critical, is these quarterbacks. The quarterback position is so important in sports. And the way those guys, namely Dylan Rayola, handle this, those guys have to be leaders. So there's a lot. Every day they have to come ready. I mean, and that's – Sean, you're putting up, they're putting a lot on young guys, but to be a leader, they have to come and perform in these things, it, not take days off, not, not, you know, oh, he's not, he's feel a little under the, with Dylan, you know, Dylan and Danny are a little under the weather today. No, that position has to be a position of strength. What I've heard about Dylan is he has attacked. I mean, he's, he's, he came for business and he's attacking this. And I'll be curious how he handles you know, the mat drills and the training this winter. And really, oh, yeah, all, everybody's curious. All 17 freshmen. But, you know, what? where do they want Dylan's 17 ball? freshmen. Incoming freshmen that are here. That are here already. Whenever you say that number, it's it freaks me out. Because that's a lot. It's like a school bus full of guys that they brought in. Sean, come on. There's been years when we've ta- Five, we're talking six, three seven. or four. Yeah. yeah. 17 true freshmen, incoming freshmen are here. Scholarship guys. No, a one walk on at the 17. Oh, one, sorry, one walk. Um, I, 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 I could just say 16, but I always like to say, I mean, Isaac Dickey's the walk on it's here early now. Too, and no, say seven back. Yeah. And then you've got six transfer guys here. And, um, Micah Mazuka was just announced on Monday by Nebraska, the offensive lineman from Florida. Monday was the last day you could get on campus to begin classes a week into the semester. So, um, I would assume that means Mazuka is here on campus in classes with Nebraska announcing him on Monday. And he could be a starting guard. So yeah, six transfers. I mean, Stefan Thompson could be a starting linebacker. Um, you know, you got two wide receivers, uh, Banks and Isaiah Naor that could be starters out there as well. So yeah, it's a really impressive group. Dante Daldell, running back, Bly Hill at corner. Yeah. I don't know that <laughs> I'd want to do it very often, but I'd love to go over there a couple days and watch that and see what it looks like. You're just watching workouts, but to be able to size up for instance, the six transfer portal guys, and what 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 do they look like? I'm just gonna tell you that they would never allow you. Over no, there. they would never, because it's 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 hardcore. Well, and the thing is, like, a lot of people don't really know how to. I mean, like, what you're watching is they, they're pushing these guys to the limit, and it would take great trust for a head coach to even allow media to watch that because you don't know like what somebody would write or say out of something like that. No, yeah. I mean, I would go only to observe. You'd have to say, I, but you can't. You can't. I mean, eventually, some of that, those impressions would filter out. Oh, if I was a head coach, I wouldn't let media near it. Back in the Pete Carroll era at USC, you know, he had more of an NFL mindset. Their summer workouts, just like the pros, were open. Anybody could go. Fans, media, just, I mean, but not very people went. No, and back in the day at Nebraska, I would go over and watch a lot of summer workouts. Now that was back pre cell phones. <laughs> pre cell phones. I mean, it was. I'm talking about. You know, there was one instance that was really interesting. I mean, you could go over to the stadium, Sean, and sit in the stands and watch them do seven on seven. So I was watching Eric Crouch and and Bobby Newcomb and Ross Pilkington. But it was just knowing that you wouldn't write about it. Mm-mm might interview somebody you, you could i mean it's you could do it and there was one time we were sitting there i was sitting there with with mike babcock in the stands and frank solich came walking through not supposed to be there um but he 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 just walked he was just walking through it's just like by like Bellis. He, yeah he, yeah he yeah and he came up with his back turned to the action and talked to us he wasn't by i don't think you'd say he was violating anything he, he was just walking through the stadium at a time when the guys happened to be there. Did he throw a fellas at you? Yeah, he threw a fellas. And he'd he always up, say, he'd greet you, Frank Soldier would say, fellas, fellas. Yep, and he kept his back to it. So he, I, he was kind of making a statement like, hey, my back's to this. I don't see what's going on. But coaches knew what was going on. I oh, mean, the strength coaches report to the coach. Right. But now, um, you know, in the summertime, the coaches get two hours a week. It's different now. You, you, they can they have those practices, like right. I mean, where the they're they're led by the coaches. Right. So there's like two a couple hours a week, right? Well, you, you get eight in the off season, like so eight per week, 
eight hours of organized activity time with your team. And that includes running, lifting and meetings and meetings. But then of those eight, two can be skills and drills with the coaches out on the field two per week. Yeah. So I, I, it is, it's changed so dramatically from the, I always think about those, those times I would watch guys. I remember, I remember when thunder Collins came in and I, I went over there just to see what that looked like. I remember, you know, Robin Miller, remember Robin Miller is yeah. highly recruited running back. I can remember going over and checking out, see what Robin Miller looked like, but you can't do that now. But yeah, Carol. So you met Ryan Abraham member at USC. Yes, I did. Uh, former rivals guy. Um, with um, USC football website. He's at 247 now. We were taught, he, he was at the Polynesian Bowl with us, but made me think of this. He used to go to every summer workout and they would post photo galleries. They'd write, oh, they'd God. write notebooks. Florida State would do It'd it. Be as, awesome. If Florida State would do it as well. And yeah. Bill Callahan back in that era comes, he's like, why aren't you doing this? Why can't, and I go, well, we can't coach. And he goes, why not? He goes, I, wa I want you to post photo galleries of our players so people, it helps us in recruiting. And so why couldn't you? It got the university said no, okay. because they didn't want, they didn't want everybody else coming over there. Okay. But Bill Callahan wanted me to come over there and take photos of the workouts and post them as content. And I'm like, yeah, we'll do a coach. Well, there would be a lot of people interested. You Some are about like in Dominican Sue and, and, you know zach taylor oh right now if we could if we could cover summer workouts it'd be wildly popular the problem is it would just be a freak show <laughs> yes because there's 70 media members here i mean it's it was just so much different when i'm talking about that babcock solich meeting in the when we were at the stadium there was only four or five guys who cared i mean media guys or, or only four or five really that would cover well it. and mike riley tried to, to let media into practice he did and he no he did let he me did. i mean i say try yeah because you know what happened was there were some young i mean there's some younger report people that have never even probably been to a football practice didn't play football they don't understand sports mm -hmm. guy had his back to the play of got a taken scrimmage. out and football 101 when you go to a game go, don't put your back to the field well this young 22 year old 24 year old kid just gets obliterated got taken out right and you didn't see mike riley get mad no very often he was fuming mad. Yeah. Because if that kid got hurt, yeah, that, you know, it's trouble. Then it's trouble for everybody. So that was kind of honestly, I felt like the last of it right there. Well, I will tell you, you're right. Because that, and I will tell you this the value of watching those practices with Riley, and we watched, would you say several, like six or seven? I, I, I went into that season with an excellent handle on that team because we had watched so much practice. Yeah, I knew every, a lot of, yeah, I knew every position group what the pecking order was and i understood tyro like ty lynn ty lindsey uh, was it ty lindsey i understood what he was all about i understood where guys were in the pecking order and what that team had you, it's hard now to understand that now because you just don't see much practice well, at all nebraska i think the problem like you mentioned the number of people so then there becomes an oversight issue where you have to have somebody there overseeing the media hurting cats we're at oregon state I'm guessing right. there weren't people no. that had to kind of babysit the media no, no. where, you know, Keith Mann and his staff would have to staff that. It's intense for them. And it's a lot of pressure. On it them. is. It's intense. I, I I think people right now that are listening are going, what are these guys talking about? It's 70. Would, would, if when Matt rule opens up practice, just he opens up for a little bit for like a half hour, two or three. Yeah. In the, it's, it's in the, the, you're out of there before. How many people are there though? 50, 60, 70 people. Yeah. So it's, it's for the staff, for the media relations staff, it's hot. It's intense. You gotta, you gotta make sure everybody's, you know, abiding by the rules. Nobody wanders out on the field. Nobody writes something that they're not supposed to. It, it, it gets really intense. See, there's two ways that you can do it that way. And you're going to get the freak show where everybody shows up. Are you just overwhelm everybody and make so much access where it's like, God, I can't possibly go to all this. Well, I got that way with Bill. I remember when Bill Callahan opened up the entire spring and fall camp. One. Yeah. The first, well, the first year he was here, it was all open. And I did have those feelings like, man, this is three hours out of the day. I mean, it and then two it, days. Yeah. And then it became more than that because you're waiting for interviews and I didn't, I started to where I didn't go to everyone. 
it was like Sundays too. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it was crazy. And I, I was young and single. I love, I mean, I was like, oh, this is how I'm, you know, I didn't have to worry about anything back then. So it was fun. I mean, it was fascinating watching Joe Daly, which I thought one day was an interception drill. I thought, you know, but he was just throwing interceptions. I thought, I thought it literally was designed for defensive backs to catch a ball and return it. No, he was just throwing picks. And I, <laughs> oh, I'll never forget really what wild. Tony Davis, former Husker running back, said to you. Um, you know, because we there were tons of incompletions on air, even. <laughs> and, and, and he goes, "Simple." He goes, "You know, you can go to NFL practice, and you might see the ball hit the ground once, one or twice. time." Yeah, <laughs> we were seeing it hit the ground like forty <laughs> times yeah. in one drill. And I got to tell you, I wasn't smart enough to realize that they were they were hurting at quarterback. I mean, I kind of started to figure it out, but man, yeah, I didn't know. I mean, they had a they had a wrestler like one of Mark Manning's prize recruits, Ryan Goodman, yeah, who ended up transferring to NC State, become their number two quarterback. Yeah, he was in the picture, in the as yeah. a newcomer. <laughs> yeah, those those were incredible days. All right, well, incredible. that was a fun show. Yeah. I'm off to Nashville, Steve Sipple. Off to Nashville, and your job is to Just some on three meetings and stuff. Okay, got got some stuff going. I'll be back Saturday, but. Uh, we got in a little bit earlier today, get the show done. So appreciate it. Uh, make sure you go to HuskerOnline.com. We got a great deal. Two months for $1 promo code in you want. And I also, I want to give Trey Yannity, our producer, a shout out. Please do. Um, he's been working with us for the last nine weeks or so. Uh, Megan Guntner, who is our normal producer, um, had, a do- had, her, had her first child. And, and she's going to rejoin our shows next week. But uh, shout out to Trey and putting up with you and me for the last night. I know Trey's amazing. He's just one of those guys who just does his job and no complaints at all. And it's not always easy, you know, dealing with us. So I appreciate it. He's Trey. A, he, um, he grew up by Clemson. He did. He's his dad Clemson is the uh, baseball play by play boy. So I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So he's, he's just Trey. I, 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 I think I can say this. He's kind of one of those behind the scenes guys. He's great though. That just grinds, grinds. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Trey. And uh, make sure you go on HuskerOnline.com. We'll have full coverage of basketball and everything else here throughout the weekend. For Steve Sipple, I'm Sean Callahan signing off for Husker Online Headlines.